So I, I hope you had a restful night uh, sleep or at least rest. Um, the last breath of prayer I uh, in my conversation with Our Lady of the Pillow last night <laughs> was for you. And it just came into my heart so sweetly and so firmly and surely that all of you would rest well. So I, I that doesn't necessarily mean length of sleep, but hopefully you had a well rested time away and if not maybe a nap is in the works for this afternoon so on to a new day the sun has found us this is wonderful one of the things i was thinking about when i was in the chapel this morning too was um if the if the kneeler is starting to sound like a roaring lion coming into the chapel <laughs> you probably have dialed back enough this is good. So you're giving your mouth a rest for a while, except for those recitations of prayer, and you're giving your eyes a little bit more uh, of a challenge. Uh, hopefully you've been soaking in some Visio Divina, and there'll be more of that coming up. And um, it's all good there. But in case you're still challenged with um, maybe having distractions, or we just, we just come with a great suitcase of worries sometimes, I wanted to share something that a priest once said to me, and I think I've shared it through uh, Seven Sisters Communique, actually. And that is, it helps in distractions when you're in prayer, but also distractions trying to just go about your day, go about this retreat, this short retreat. And that is, uh, this priest said, what you do is you, you, you sit yourself down and you position yourself to watch a slideshow. And that slideshow are all of those things that are troubling to you right at that moment. Or things that you normally pray for, but you really want to give that to the Lord in a deeper way in a retreat like this. So he said, put that first slide up there. It might be your spouse or your neighbor or one of your children, the whole family, um, a relationship. It might be that. Put it up on something like a screen like that, really big. And just simply say, Jesus, I trust in you. Jesus, take this for today. It's not like he's not asking you to ever pray for that or to continue to pray for it. But for now, maybe hit the pause button. Slide number two. Whatever it might be, your work situation, a misunderstanding that you had, desire to go to confession and you're a little bit nervous about it. Whatever it might be, Jesus, I trust in you. So I might commend that to you if you are having trouble kind of entering that interior silence that a retreat is all about and is what the Lord has called you to. So give that a try. It, I use it quite a number of times when I'm having especially a large number of distractions when I'm trying to be more focused in, in a Eucharistic Adoration Chapel. And it has served me well over an arc of time. So I commend that to you. So we're back discussing these two great gifts of the church, the Eucharist and Mary. The church refers to them as the golden gifts. No doubt they are right. Because they're so rich, they're so full of all that we need. Little explanation is needed that they are called golden because they are gifts without measure. So it's understandable because they are so broad and deep that this is going to kind of be a broad sweep. But the goal is that it's heightening an awareness for me and an awareness for you to take that invitation of Mother Church to go deeper. Not only in each in a devotion to our Eucharistic Lord and to Our Lady, but how the Church brings them inseparably, inseparably together. I thought for this conference right before Mass, that I would speak about Mary and the Mass, and hopefully there'll be some new things for you in it. I was very heartened that Father chose for the, uh, the audio at breakfast. Some of you uh, may have heard Father speaking about the Eucharist. And in fact, I'm going to bring up some points that he brought up, and I felt such a solidarity in the Holy Spirit. Uh, we're going to be talking about St. John Bosco's dream a little bit later today. So it was very heartening for me, but I thought the Lord really asked me to speak firmly about Mary. And, and the Eucharist is all going to be coming into that. But I think Father's uh, topic 
was really the Eucharistic Lord. So I thought, how perfect. So uh, Father Coulter was really listening well as well. So let's take a look at the contrast of these two things that are linked together. So the Lord in, our, in the Eucharist is the living God. It's his true presence, even though many Catholics have forgotten that. Uh, it is the living God. It's He is infinite. He is the uncreated one. But he's linking himself with Mary, who is what? She's like you and I. She's a creature. She is created. And she is finite. What else about the Blessed Sacrament? The Blessed Sacrament, we give a, a homage and a devotion and a worship that Mother Church calls Latria. And that is reserved for God alone. The Eucharistic presence is the God of heaven. He's the Alpha and the Omega. He is the Word made flesh. He is God. We give him worship and adoration due to God. What about Mary? We get a lot of accusations from those on the other side of the threshold, right? Maybe some of you that are even among us that are converts. It's like, well, those Catholics, are, they're always after Mary, you know? They're really worshiping her. And we give her uh, reverence, to be sure, and we give her homage. But it is a lesser homage, and the church calls it a hyperdulia. So she doesn't ignore the fact that we do that, and we should do that. She's the, the primary saint. She's the principal saint. She's the one that we look at of, of great perfection. But the type of homage and reverence that we give her is, is, is quite inferior to what we give the Lord. So in seeing this contrast, how then does God link these two inseparably? He does. It's his choice that he desires to come through a creature. And it's, it was disturbing to the heavens, right? So much so that Satan couldn't stand for that plan. And it's felt like this was the thing that caused him to go against the will of God and say, I'm not going to do it. We're not going to have a creature taking that kind of role in history. And so the heavens were disturbed. But by divine providence, the Lord does link himself inseparably to Mary. I saw one of you at least, and maybe more of you have a miraculous medal on. If you turn that over, the Sacred Heart and the Immaculate Heart are what? In some, in some of the things, they're linked, and, but very close together, right? Side by side, right? Not one, but side by side. St. John Paul II called that the alliance, the admirable alliance of hearts. And you get to speak to that so perfectly. An admirable alliance of hearts. Almost sacred, most loving heart of Jesus, says St. John Henry Newman, who had a great love for both and was a convert to the faith. Thou art concealed in the Holy Eucharist. He's speaking about the heart of Jesus. And thou beatest still. Thou art the heart of the Most High made man. Thy sacred heart is the instrument and the organ of thy love. It did beat for us. It yearned for us. It ached for our salvation. It was on fire through zeal that the glory of God might be manifested in and by us. In worshiping thee, I worship my incarnate God. My Emmanuel. So here, this great mind of the church, this convert to the faith, this cardinal, has linked the incarnate God with the sacred heart of Jesus. And so beautifully done with so many beautiful words. And so there is a link up to the incarnation that is echoed by many. I want to draw your attention to this book by Father Richard Foley. I would commend it to your reading if you are a reader, and if not, I'm going to give you a few excerpts from it today. I came upon this book. He, he is a Jesuit uh, contemporary. Uh, I, when I came back to the church, one of the things that 
I just was compelled to do was first of all go to daily mass. I didn't know why, but I was just completely compelled. And I had a chart at home that told all of the different <clears throat> daily mass times in the Twin Cities so that I would not miss it. And if I got up later, I was distracted and forgot. I could then go to 10 o'clock mass. If I missed that, I could go to 11.15 or 12 o'clock. I had the whole thing, the whole day planned out. I also have to come on some Eucharistic chapels. And the Twin Cities has this great gift. At one time, we had over 70 perpetual Eucharistic chapels. And it's no wonder that maybe the Seven Sisters Apostolate was born there because there were so many adoration chapels. And of course, in the beginning of Seven Sisters, Father and I, we had this wild imagination, like what if all the pastors in the Twin Cities were covered? It could be possible because there's so many Eucharistic chapels. Of course, he had a bigger plan than that, but that was a big colossal plan for, I, for, for Father and I. But anyway, I found a chapel. Somebody told me there was a chapel that was the first established in the Twin Cities. And I thought, I'm gonna go there. I'm gonna see what it's like. So it was a little, a little chapel outside of the church proper itself in North St. Paul. I went to the chapel and there was one other person there. It was a, a lovely, tiny little chapel. And I walked in and I, I, I prayed for quite a while. And then I thought, I'm just gonna rest a while. And when I sat back, I sat on this book. <laughs> and so I thought, oh, well, that's curious, Mary and the Eucharist. Now, again, I'd been in the Protestant world for about 10 years, and I'm thinking, well, this ought to be a curious book. Maybe I'll give it a shot. Three hours later, I left the chapel. I just consumed this book. And what came to me were so many realizations about what we're talking about today, the linking of Mary and the Eucharist in such an inseparable way. So he does a beautiful, reading this book is like, I just believe it's like having these bouquets of flowers just keep opening and opening and opening because he's so gifted in his words, his choice of words, he sees from England, and just how all these uh, interweavings of, of doctrine and scripture and all of these beautiful things, which we can't go into today, but it serves as a, a really a launching pad for you to delve deeper into maybe one area that might be of interest to you or where the Lord's leading you to grow. And one of the things that he said that, that struck me that day and it continues to strike me is that he said, as Jesus was forming in Mary's womb and his heart was being knit in her womb, his heart was being knit under the heart of Mary and that then the hearts were beating in unison. And I, I just long remember that. I'm, I'm also a nurse, and I work with prenatals quite a bit. And one of the things I tell these moms, because they come in maybe at 10 or 12 weeks, and there's just no sense of, they're just not quite sure what's happening, except that they've missed their period. But I say, you know, 18 days after the egg and the sperm have come together, heart starts beating. I said, we can't really see it, but technology has allowed us to know that that happens. And I go like this with my hands and their eyes just get so big. And then we kind of go through, you know, when did the fingerprints form and 10 weeks, today your baby's about 10 weeks, your baby's smiling and it just, it just brings us great joy. But there is a belief that the heart rate of the mother and the baby do coincide for a period of time. And then the heart necessarily needs to be faster for this little person who's growing. And it's probably about three times as fast or maybe twice as fast for the mother, for the, for the baby. But I think this is such a beautiful reflection that deserves our reflection maybe from Father Foley, that these hearts were being, uh, his heart was being formed and being enfleshed by her, all that he was about was in fleshment from his mother. So Mary, in a sense, in a real sense, became the first tabernacle. And we too are called to be tabernacles on legs, right? You ever heard somebody, a priest, invite you to remember that? We are tabernacles with legs. And so here at that time of formation, that formation of heart, that formation of body, that enfleshment, which was necessary for the sacrifice, right? 
uh, that admirable alliance started, that admirable alliance that John Paul II talks about started. So again, one of the things that um, Father Foley does as well is he moves through all of these links with our Lord and our Lady, and he starts with her fiat. And then he moves into the place where she is mothering Jesus in Nazareth. He speaks about that, how their hearts are continually linked. He moves uh, Mary with Jesus through his ministerial years. She's alongside him. And then where does it put her? At the foot of the cross in Calvary. And how beautiful someone gifted me with that crucifix right before I came. And it was such a perfect addition because all of these images of Mary with grapes, and here is Mary collecting the pressing of the grapes, the pressing of the love of Christ in a chalice. So how beautiful, beautifully fitting that was. And that is the place of Mary. She's never left his side. And today we'll see she continues to be at his side in Holy Mass. St. Bernard of Clairvaux, some of you might have a devotion to him. He's a beautiful French priest who had a great devotion uh, to the holy name of Jesus, but also to Mary. And here's what he says. There were really two altars on Calvary. One was in Mary's heart, the other in Christ's body. He sacrificed his flesh, Mary, her soul. So as we move into this discussion of Mary at the Mass, she is at the foot of the cross, co-sacrificing in a sense, in union with her son. Again, she's, a, she, she's provided the flesh. And it was something that I think, when I read this, I thought I never thought of that that the enfleshment of Jesus is coming from a creature. Something to ponder and to continue to ponder. The Vespers hymn for Our Lady of Sorrows helps us kind of picture the scene of Mary at, at the foot of the cross. Under the world redeeming wood, the most afflicted mother stood. Her son upon its altar laid the eternal expiation made. So again, there's the expiation for us needed to happen with the crucifixion of, of our flesh. And the way could be many ways, but this was, this was the perfect way, and this was the way of the plan of God. And so the holy sacrifice of the Mass for we as Catholics, and even for all those that don't understand it, or see it with one eye only, and maybe that eye is, is not so clear, is that as a representation of that greatest of sacrifices, and we know that. So, is it a wonder then that maybe Mary is not also present at that representation of Calvary? And maybe it's something that you imagined, or maybe you even have had a little glimpse, the veil has been moved over for you at one time, and you actually in your mind's eye have realized that, or maybe today it's kind of like, I never thought of that. The altar's full enough with Jesus, I never thought about that. We're gonna think about it a little today. So the sacrifice of the cross is sacramentally realized on our altars. And again, at mass, we continue to experience and meditate on that extreme love that comes from the sacrifice. So the question today is how does Mary fit in the altar sacrifice at, at the altar sacrifice as she did on Calvary? A lot of the saints again have said it better than I can say it. And I'm going to start with this one with St. John Paul II, who as a pope said this. Every Mass is a memorial of that one sacrifice and that Passover which restored life to the world. Every Mass puts us into intimate communion with her, the Mother, whose sacrifice becomes present 
just as the sacrifice of her son becomes present at the words of consecration. At the root of the Eucharist is the virginal and maternal life of Mary. So using that as a launch, we, we trust that if they John Paul too, right? I'm going to launch into five testimonies of others that have said similar things and we'll expand the idea of that. Before I go into that, I just want to tell a little story about how one time when I was at the uh, Mass at the Missionaries of Charity, and I'm a lay missionary of charity, so I attend the Mass probably three or four times a week. It's a very small chapel. Maybe some of you have been there or been to Missionary of Charity chapels. All of their crucifixes uh, coming out of the side of Christ on the wall, it says, I thirst. It was the, the primary meditation of Mother Teresa, primary meditation of myself as a lay missionary of charity, of how the Lord is thirsting for you, thirsting for me. So a priest was offering Mass there. He was actually the vocation director uh, at the time of our archdiocese, a very holy man, very deep thinking man. And in this little chapel, the four sisters are there, and there's probably about three uh, uh, lay people there usually three, three to maybe five. And Father, at, during his homily, um, leaned over and he said, and I will I'll have to preface this with saying, if you've ever attended Mass with the Missionaries of Charity, whenever they listen to a reading, they are riveted on the person. They're so focused in everything they do. And during the homily, it's the same way. They, they just, you hardly believe they're breathing. They're so focused on what is going on in that present moment. So they're all like statues looking at this priest and he's leaning over and he said, did you hear the angels during the consecration? Now I've been to mass there many times and the sisters are kind of like leaning forward. <laughs> it's a beautiful moment. They all kind of lean forward. And then he said, did you see this? Did you see the angels during the consecration? And they're still leaning forward. And he said, even if you didn't hear them or see them, they were here. And then they're kind of settled back. <laughs> but what it did for me is it, it just reminded me at that moment, it's bigger than this little tiny chapel in Minneapolis where there's gunfire outside the windows oftentimes, lots of ambulance noises. And then Father said something so beautiful. He said, when I lift the host at Mass, the consecrated our Lord, our Eucharistic Lord, he said, the effect of his rays are not just for you, sisters, and you back there. He said, it's for this neighborhood. He said, I always imagine the rays going farther than I can imagine. And he said, that too is as real as the angels being at this table. It changed the way I attended Mass, honestly. I think a father just yesterday in his elevation, this is affecting so much more than us and this retreat center. Here's the testimonies. Okay, the first one is Ignatius Loyola, which was the founder of the Jesuits from Spain. He, he kept a diary. This particular entry was in the year 1544 during the Feast of the Presentation. And this is what he had to say about Mary's presence. During much of this time, before, during, and after Mass, I felt and saw clearly that Our Lady was very propitious, pleading before the Father. Indeed, during the prayers to the Father and the Son, and at his consecration, I could not but feel and see her as though she were part, or rather portal, of the great grace that I could feel in my spirit. At the consecration, she showed that her own flesh was that of her Son, with so many intuitions that they could not be written. And we know what a prolific writer St. Ignatius Loyola was. 
what struck me in this particular one, again, I maybe first time you're hearing this and I've gone over and over this, but the statement about the portal of the great grace and how well we know as Catholics that Mary is that portal of grace. Remember St. Catherine Labore when she went to see Mary, where she saw Mary, and all these rays were coming out of her fingers. And she's like, what is that? She says, these are all the graces that no one has asked for. No one has asked for these. So she is that conduit, that portal of grace. It was something that the veil was moved over a little bit for Ignatius, and he recorded it for us to appreciate in 2022, all that way from 1544. It's the same truth, the same goodness, the same beauty. Here's someone you might be familiar with. And just to give a sense of time, uh, she was not Saint Faustina at the time, but she was Blessed Faustina in the writing of this book. She too kept a diary. This, was, this entry was on December 8th, the Feast of the Immaculate Conception. <clears throat> From early morning, I felt the nearness of the Blessed Mother. During Holy Mass, I saw her so lovely and so beautiful that I have no words to express even a small part of her of this beauty. She was all in white with a blue sash around her waist. Her cloak was also blue and there was a crown on her head. Marvelous light streamed forth from her whole figure. She said, I am the queen of heaven and earth, but especially the mother of your congregation. She pressed me to her heart and said, I feel constant compassion for you. I felt the force of her immaculate heart, which was communicated to my soul. Now I understand why I have been preparing for this feast for two months and have been looking forward to it with such yearning. Wow, we learn a lot from that, right? The preparation. We barely can make it there to prepare for five minutes before Mass, right? And she's preparing for two months for this one Mass. And the beautiful thing of this is Mary comes to us when we need it. And St. Faustina needed that at that point. We have to believe she did providentially need that at the height of the most important prayer of St. Faustina's day. We haven't had that yet, right? We're anticipating it. One of the reasons I'm giving this now, so that you can maybe take some of these things that you might prepare in a better way when Father prepares to celebrate Mass a little bit later this morning. Number, number three. This one, too, not a saint at the time, Padre Pio. This one was from a letter, but it was a telling about an interview that Padre Pio had with Padre Alberto de Apolito. Padre Pio said, What great care Our Lady took to accompany me to the altar this morning! Exclamation point. It seemed to me that she had nothing else to think about except me. As she filled my whole heart, with sentiments of holy love. Padre Diabolito asks, was the Madonna present at your mass? Yes, she placed herself to the side, but I could see her. What joy, what paradise. Padre Diabolito, has she attended your mass only once or is she always present? Padre Pio. How can the mother of Jesus, present at the foot of the cross on Calvary, and offered her son as victim for the salvation of souls, be absent at the mystical Calvary of the Heart? Padre Diabolito, is Our Lady present at all Masses being celebrated in the world? Padre Pio, yes. Padre Diabolito, 
Do the angels also attend? A big deal. The whole celestial court is present. And then Padre Diopolito concluded the above interview with this comment. That is why Holy Mass was both Calvary and Paradise for Padre Pio. Number four. This is a priest, some of you may be familiar with him, Father, Father uh, Stefano Golbi. He uh, founded the Marian Movement of Priests. And this is an excerpt from his book called To the Priests, Our Ladies Beloved Sons, written in 1984. And he, he uh, describes it as Our Lady's Message on Good Friday, written on Good Friday. Good Friday is repeated when Jesus immolates himself for you, though in an unbloody manner in the sacrifice of the Holy Mass. The supreme gift of this day is mystically renewed for you. But close to Jesus who emulates himself, the sorrowful oblation of your mother is also repeated. She is always present, close to every altar upon which Mass is celebrated, just as she is present during that long and sorrowful Good Friday. And then the last one is by a new, newly recognized saint in our midst, and that's Paul VI. <clears throat> to understand the place of Mary in the celebration of Mass, we need to recall two fundamental principles. First, our Lord did not begin the work of our redemption without the consent of Mary, solemnly asked and freely given. Likewise, he did not complete it on Calvary without her presence and consent. The simple words of St. John have inexhaustible meaning. By the cross of Jesus stood his mother. She not only freely surrendered her maternal rights over her son, but she also offers herself together with him for the salvation of the world. She participates in an unsurpassable way in the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. She stood by the cross of Jesus on Calvary, representing all mankind there, and at each new Mass, the offering of the Savior is accomplished. Subject to the same conditions, Mary stands at the altar no less than she stood by the cross, she is there as ever, cooperating with Jesus, the woman foretold from the beginning, crushing the serpent's head. A loving attention to her ought, therefore, to form part of every Mass rightly heard. We know that it is the whole Church in heaven and on earth that offers the sacrifice of Christ on the cross at Mass, but the words of the liturgy stress our communion with Mary, in communion with those whose memory we venerate, especially the glorious ever-Virgin Mary, Mother of our God and Lord, Jesus Christ. I know some of these things it's hard to listen to and um, be able to absorb it all, so I again commend the book to you and different writings that you may come upon, just to give yourself the gift of meditation about what we're speaking about tonight. All these testimonies, or this afternoon, morning, <laughs> all of these testimonies uh, echo one another. They don't counter one another. They repeat one another, but then they, they give a, a new element of, of what that particular person may have uh, gained, the light that that person got, somewhat like a photo Photos taken of the same position and maybe slightly different angle, slightly different lighting from where that person was standing. Similar kind of thing. But in the Mass, too, one thing that would be familiar with us is in the Confidior, in the very beginning of Mass, we're asking Mary to pray for us, aren't we? We're admitting 
that we need the mass, that we're there for forgiveness, we're there to be nourished and nurtured. And so we're asking our mother, the mother of uh, the church, to help us, to pray for us. And so we acknowledge her presence, at least at that point in the mass. Mary is included in the preparatory prayers of the faithful, uh, receiving communion uh, sometimes. And I, I wanna offer this too as something offered to me at a retreat long ago where a priest said to, uh, while we we're waiting for our pew to be dismissed uh, or for the priest to come and bring communion to us, to commend that receiving of communion to be received through the Immaculate Heart of Mary. She said, while you're sitting, maybe standing, putting the kneeler up, then that ask Mary, ask our Lord to help you to receive him through the Immaculate Heart of his mother. And then he further counseled us at that retreat. When we got into the aisle to allow silence to overwhelm us, he said, just allow that silence because the Lord maybe wants to speak to you during that time, or he wants your heart to expand in order to receive him through the Immaculate Heart of Mary. So it has become a habit for me, and it's a beautiful um, practice. But more than that, it's uh, it's a beautiful portal of grace uh, in my life during Holy Communion. So allow grace maybe to enter your heart in that way during your communions, and I ask you to consider that. I think enough has been said, enough has been read. I want to leave enough time uh, in the beginning of this conference. I said I, I really wanted to sort of start disappearing, and hopefully that's happening for you already in what I have to say, really, and just in, just in my presence here, because it really is about uh, your being called here by the Lord himself. And so I want enough time uh, for you uh, to be given to prepare for Holy Mass and do that in whatever way you want uh, in the chapel or here in front of uh, some images for a little bit more of Visio Divina. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. All glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, it is now, and it shall be, for all to die, and Amen. Our Lady of Good Counsel, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.